Yeah, I guess in the blockchain world, like, I don't know, as we all know, I like Ethereum. So I think that's pretty, I don't know, pretty decentralized. Like, community is really strong. Like, I think it's not really going anywhere soon. Like, there's always I don't know, technical updates and that kind of thing, um, as opposed to you know, maybe Bitcoin that's kind of slowing down in that regard. Um, and then, yeah, like, I think Monero, as long as the community stays strong, like, we kind of stay together and don't get divided over like whatever random reddit drama is happening like i think this week on monero talk is sponsored by cake wallet store send receive and exchange your monero and bitcoin safely on ios and android too cake wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and by ivpn resist online surveillance with ivpn a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. CakeWallet and iVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your CakeWallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman chats with Elizabeth Binks, who is developing an Ethereum to Monero Atomic swap implementation that has launched on Testnet. Elizabeth tells us why she dedicated her time to building this utility for the Monero and Ethereum projects, gave us her technical perspective on crypto projects in general, revealed the assistance she can use from the community, and what she may want to work on next for Monero. Unfortunately, Doug and Elizabeth lost 20 minutes of recording that Doug claims was an epic convo, but they recovered well and pretty much rehashed what was lost. We hope you are as excited as we are to see the Monero project continue to attract brilliant minds like Elizabeth that are in it for creating a more decentralized future. Monero Talk starts now. Yeah, um, yeah, so I guess initially, um, yeah, why I started the project, um, yeah, I guess I personally would like to use the, the swap, so um, I kind of, I don't know, had a need for it personally, and I looked and there wasn't really anything out there on it currently, so I decided, um, yeah, just kind of go for it and implement it, and yeah, hopefully people use it as well. So. And then, so obviously you, you have technical abilities uh, beyond just, you know, this project here. You've been working in blockchain for quite some time. You have a good understanding of Ethereum. We worked on that quite a bit, uh, and some other blockchain projects. So I think what we were getting at was how do you view these projects differently, given that you have such a good understanding on a technical level of, you know, Monero and Ethereum. Uh, we spoke about how, uh, you know, Monero isn't as user friendly in terms of development. Uh, there was, you know, some things that should be done there to improve the environment for, you know, new devs to start, you know, inter interoperating with uh, Monero. But overall, like, what's your your technical take on these projects yeah yeah for sure so um yeah yeah like i said before um the the i think all these blockchains kind of have different goals or values in mind um so just basically going off of that like it's hard to compare like monero and ethereum in certain ways or monero and bitcoin in certain ways or monero and like these other interoperability protocols um just because they all sort of have such different goals in mind and like the communities value totally different things. So um, like in terms of, um, I don't know, being like the biggest smart contract, like comp programmable computer or whatever, then Ethereum is obviously like technically the, the king in that regard. But in terms of, I'd say like actual, um, yeah, like privacy tech and being actually used by people, like Monero definitely wins in that regard. Um, so yeah, so I guess, Another different thing I've noticed about Monero is that there's only um, one client implementation, like there's only the one C++ Monero D implementation. Um, a lot of other blockchains have multiple implementations, not all, but like a lot of them do. So um, that's just something I've noticed, like I don't know if um, ever having like an alternative client would be interesting. Um, I'm not sure like how, like I guess the code base is pretty old in some ways, because I believe it was a fork from a previous um code base as well so i'm not sure like it maybe it's like getting hard to maintain or there's like legacy code or that kind of thing so um yeah that's just something i noticed like a lot of other blockchains i guess haven't been around as long so maybe the code base is 
less legacy in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I say the the networking, I suppose, on Monero is very um, privacy focused, which is nice. Um, I think we have like the Dandelion Plus Plus implantation um, uh, for the transaction gossiping, but um, yeah, like other blockchains don't really have anything like that. Like I don't even know, I don't actually know if it was added to Bitcoin or not. I think it was originally for that. I don't know if it was added, so don't quote me, but. <laughs> I don't think it was. Yeah, I don't think it was either. I could be wrong though. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, stuff like that is really interesting. Um, the fact that at, there, at like every level there's kind of um, privacy stuff happening. Um, yeah, I guess, was there anything like specifically you wanted to talk about? No, no, I just really uh, wanted to get your kind of, your technical, your, your opinion really of these different right. projects, these competing projects but from a technical perspective, because you have one, mm -hmm. one that most people don't have. Uh, so th those are all interesting insights. The, you know, the Monero kind of being uh, kind of old, old tech is an interesting one in that like needing, needing an update from a code level uh, is interesting. And, and you were getting at that too, you know, when you said earlier in the, in the clips that we lost uh, about it being difficult to mm -hmm. develop with Monero uh, that's part of that, right? I guess, right? If it was, you know, maybe on an updated code base, it could it could be easier to work with. Is that mm, fair to say? potentially? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think mostly for developing on it, it's more like probably docs and like tooling that would need to be updated more than like the the client itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I think like having yeah, like I mentioned earlier, like a a kind of testing node, like a local node, um, kind of like Ganache for Ethereum would be really useful. Um, like we, there sort of is that with Monero, um, but it doesn't have like the wallets built in, like you don't have to do that separately. Um, so it's just, it's not like a kind of one, one command kind of, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but yeah, I don't think that's really on the protocol level. It's more just like on the tooling side. So then, yeah, on the, on the tech, any, any other insights then into, Monero itself and, and what it's trying to achieve. So obviously it's trying to be digital cash. Do you have any opinions there? Do you look at these projects like that? Um, you know, based on what their value props and what they're what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think I'm, I mostly look at them from like their value propositions, I would say. So um, like, yeah, in terms of being private digital cash, like I think Monero definitely achieves that. Um, yeah, like other blockchains are, I don't know, into different things, like they're into being programmable, they're into being I don't know, interoperable with other chains, like um, scalable, like that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's all all pretty different for each chain, I'd say. Yeah. So then, why not? Uh, why didn't you work on Zcash, or why didn't you work <laughs> on you know uh, you know the privacy aspects of Bitcoin? Why spend your valuable time uh, trying to make atomic swaps with Monero? Right, yeah. Like honestly, Monero has the biggest user cap, like user base. Um, it has the biggest market cap of any privacy coin. If that's like something you want to kind of take into consideration, um, yeah. Like it just is like the most used coin. Um, like I've personally used it. I've never had a reason to personally use Zcash or um, I don't know. I've used Bitcoin obviously, but it feels like Bitcoin feels very legacy at this point. Like it just doesn't feel like. The, the future, I would say. Um, so it doesn't interest me as much, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. And then I know I, I had asked you this, but I think it was a good thing to talk about. Any yeah. future projects that you may want to work on with regards to Monero? Right. Yeah. So um, obviously, yeah, finishing the swap, I'd say, and getting it really up there is my first priority. But after that, um, I think I'd be interested in looking into um, the Monero, um, actual the client implementation. So um, yeah, potentially like improvements there or protocol level improvements. Um, yeah, like taking part in, I don't know if there's any sort of stuff that needs to be fixed or improved or um, I don't know, helping people with protocol updates and that kind of thing. Yeah, pretty, pretty open to things. But I think it'd be interesting to look into there. Yeah, I think another thing I didn't mention earlier was also like tooling. So potentially like having tooling for other languages, um, like the the current implementation is all C++. So um, having like Rust or Go tooling would be nice as well, I guess. Just like kind of libraries for it. Yeah. And then, yeah, any particular aspects of the protocol itself that you'd want to work on if you were doing 
doing that type of stuff. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned earlier, I think the networking, I really like networking stuff. Um, I mean, I'm not, I haven't looked that deeply into like the Monero client code, but um, I think it would be interesting to kind of look into that and see maybe if there's things that could be improved there. Um, and as well, like the actual uh, privacy parts of the protocol. So um, potentially if that decides to move to um, ZK Snarks or some other sort of technology, I think that would be interesting to, to work on as well. But yeah. Like I said, I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, we had a whole uh, diatribe about that as well. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see where that goes. I, I think it, Monero, you know, it, it doesn't want to do anything until it knows it's the, the safest move to make where, you know, privacy won't be put at risk. And mm -hmm. while their approach sounds sounds great in theory, and maybe it is as, as good as, as they, they say, uh, it may not be worth taking the risk right, on, right away and uh, just continuing to use ring signatures for as long as we can until we have to move. Uh, but yeah, uh, way, way above my pay grade on that. Um, and then I think we spoke about the lock time, right? The 20 minute, like right. can you be, our, be our savior and, and fix that. Is that something you're, you're interested in looking at or that you're familiar with? Yeah, I, I would be interested, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in looking into that for sure. I haven't previously, so yeah. Could be some interesting solutions there. So I think I think we caught up to our you know thirty minute convo in uh, eleven minutes. Uh, we left that we left out a few things. So then continuing where we were, can you give us more of your you know your background? I mean, so you said you were you've been working on blockchain stuff for for quite some time. I mean, you you seem pretty pretty young. I mean, when when did you get in? You don't have to give away you know uh, any identifying data about yourself. But curious, like when did you? What were you doing before blockchain stuff? I mean, were you coding other things? Like, how, how did you get into the whole blockchain uh, tech thing? Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, okay, yeah. <laughs> I guess I first um, found out about Bitcoin like in, in high school. So that was like quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, over 10 years ago, I guess. Um, so I was kind of aware of it since then, but I didn't really start like developing on it until um, university. So that was, yeah, four or five years ago. I'm giving away a lot of info now. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I didn't really start getting um, get into the developing part until then. But um, I like programmed before that, um, like casually, I would say nothing super in depth because I was obviously like still a student. Um, but yeah. So yeah, in university, I started doing um, Ethereum related um, development. So yeah, started off with like just smart contracts and that kind of thing. And then um, started working professionally, I guess, in blockchain. And then um, yeah, started doing more stuff on the protocol level, like um, yeah, blockchain client development um, for various different protocols, um, bridging, like, I don't know, various, various different things. Yeah. What what drove you to start working on like smart contracts for Ethereum? I mean, what was the what was the interest there? You know, what what did you, <laughs> you find so interesting about it? Like, what, why why even dabble in those things? It's not like you know, it's not like um, you know, a sexy. I'm gonna go build uh, you know the next Facebook and you know, uh, become the next billionaire because I created some some new software. It's like I'm gonna go mess around with Ethereum smart contracts. Like, what what was the motivating factor to uh, to dabble in that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess I was like, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I was into Bitcoin previously. And like, I just, I really like the decentralized ethos of it, I suppose. Um, like, personally, I was never wanting to go work at like Facebook or any of these companies. Like, I feel like it's very soul sucking, I guess, to work there. Um, yeah, so I had no interest in that, honestly, like, I wanted to work on I don't know, stuff that was like decentralized and, and privacy preserving that would actually like, make an impact on people's lives that wasn't like a bad impact that like social media or like all these big tech companies kind of have at this point um like yeah like i think i've always been sort of politically minded in that regard like i think um the the power is very concentrated in these big companies at the moment and um and like the, the government and, like all that kind of stuff so we really need to decentralize and create these technologies to allow us not to be so reliant on, yeah, these. What, 
was there a moment where you like realized the you know the difference between centralization and decentralization like is that something that you were always cognizant of because for me it was kind of a real breakthrough like I, I you know you'd hear the word but it wasn't until like I really started to understand Bitcoin that I was like oh wow I wow it's actually nobody controls it is that something that you kind of yeah. always knew because you're you're just of that type or was there some moment where you had this realization like we could you know there's this new technology that could potentially be decentralized and unstoppable and you're like whoa like what was <laughs> the, uh, or you're like oh yeah of course there is <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think when I first you were young, you were very young when you came across it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I feel like um, I was I sort of had like those inclinations even before I heard about Bitcoin. But then when I heard about it, it really like kind of solidified that there was like this tangible thing out there that was actually currently decentralized and like currently doing these things. Um, yeah, I'd say before that it was more like latent ideas kind of from like, I don't know, just like reading books and like that kind of thing. But um yeah when i i guess first heard about it it was it was very um yeah mind-blowing i suppose in that regard <laughs> yeah same with like um finding out about like tor and like all the like decentralized kind of private networks and that kind of thing um yeah it was all pretty mind-blowing for <laughs> young me do you think these things can actually be as decentralized and unstoppable as as we hope for do you think uh it's, it's actually possible yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I would like to think so. Like, I think um, if there's enough people who are interested in the tech and or want to use it, um, like it can happen. Like, I think a lot of it is like adoption. Like, we really need to kind of shift the focus of the average person to realize that um, centralized stuff is bad and that we do need to start shifting towards these decentralized technologies. Um, so I think, yeah, part of it is kind of like a mind shift in the average person. Um, I think we're slowly starting to see this happen, but could, I don't, could definitely increase in level, I'd say. Um, yeah, and, and also, I guess, even though, um, yeah, even though um, blockchain and stuff is all decentralized or whatever, it still runs on the internet, which is very centralized in certain ways. Um, like, we all rely on, like, our ISPs for internet, like, and that's all... I don't know, conglomerate into these ISP towers or whatever. Um, so potentially it would be interesting to see if there's other ways around that. Like I think for like a truly kind of parallel society, we'd probably have to really like, I don't know, move away from t everything that's centralized. So like even, yeah, even the internet, even like those kind of things, um, like potentially like, I don't know how this would be <laughs> technically achieved, but I think it's something that um, we should consider. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've often thought about that, but I, I, I certainly don't have any real technical. Do you have any like, kind of technical concepts that could, like mesh net type stuff or? Yeah, like I'd say, yeah, mostly mesh net type stuff um, on like a grander scheme than that. Like I think mesh nets are pretty like local. So obviously, like going across the ocean and mesh net would be um, pretty hard. So. Yeah, I'm not sure. And then what becomes the incentive to to run the network, and then that becomes right. like a cryptocurrency type thing, or tied into? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting, actually. Decentralized internet with cryptocurrency. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's has there been attempts? Oh, yeah. Right. Well, isn't that kind of what Ethereum's kind of? Well, like, without the hardware. Yeah, we need the decentralized network itself mm -hmm. or whatever. Um. Interesting, interesting. So, which uh, which projects do you think uh, are the most decentralized or, or and unstoppable? Which ones are doing the best jobs at that? Uh, which ones are the most decentralized? Um, I'd say. Like which ones do you think are actually? Let's say the most unstoppable, right? Because that's really what I. That's the goal, right? Decentralized is a means to a goal, and the, mm -hmm. and the real goal is having this unstoppable network uh, that allows people to communicate information peer-to-peer -peer in an unstoppable way without censorship uh and nobody can nobody can can prevent that from happening so right. like, yeah. Yeah. any any comments there so you know which ones are achieving that the best and yeah totally yeah i guess in the blockchain world like i don't know as we all know i like ethereum so i think that's pretty i don't know pretty centralized like community is really strong like i think 
it's not really going anywhere soon. Like there's always I don't know, technical updates and that kind of thing, um, as opposed to I don't know, maybe Bitcoin that's kind of slowing down in that regard. Um, and then, yeah, like I think Monero, as long as the community stays strong, like we kind of stay together and don't get divided over like whatever random Reddit drama is happening. Like I think. Um, good advice, good advice. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And then I guess aside from the blockchain world, I'm also really into um, IPFS, which is a, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's like a decentralized um, file sharing, I guess, platform you could say. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so if you've heard of Filecoin, it's like- Yeah, I was gonna say, isn't that like Filecoin? Okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's pretty closely related. Um, so yeah, I think that is really interesting for the file sharing kind of side of things. Like a lot of, um, you, know, you could have like decentralized websites or like a lot of people like host their NFT products on there, for example. Um, yeah, like all sorts of things can be hosted on there. So in the file sharing space, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. What do you see as being like the the biggest risks? So, you know that that could prevent. You know, we said we don't know if if these things can actually come to fruition. If they actually are unstoppable, what do you see as being the biggest risk risk against them? Is it some like potential technical flaw or? Um, I mean, it could be technical flaws, but I think like the biggest potential problem would probably just be the community behind things. Like if potentially like the, I don't know, the state got really scared of some I don't know, product or community or whatever, like they could launch some sort of social attack against them um, mm. and like totally like break the community apart and just cause complete chaos or something like that. Um, so I think social means are probably the, the biggest kind of weak point, I would say. Um, like technically, like, I don't know, people are always innovating. Like there's always new tech coming out. Like that doesn't really concern me as much. Um, it's more like whether yeah people can actually like band together and kind of yeah really just stay on these kind of goals and that kind of thing yeah, yeah i mean it's really up to the people right to just opt okay. in and start using these things and not be their own worst enemy yeah. um so i any any thoughts or advice on on how to you know steer a community in that direction yeah um <laughs> i had yeah, not as much insight here not like a community manager or anything. Yeah, but, just wonder if you think, uh, you know, these things you think about, yeah. Yeah, like I guess, um, yeah, like I think I kind of mentioned earlier, like bad actors coming in and trying to like break apart the community. Um, like I think just really being vigilant about that and just not letting like, I don't know, those kind of things, like being able to like identify them first of all and not letting um, I don't know, everything like get to your head or like everything get super personal or that kind of thing, like definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. I've seen I don't know, just people feel very personal about things on on certain topics. Um, yeah, I guess just being aware of like potential threats, I suppose, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, being able to yeah, kind of keep that in mind when interacting, and yeah, just realize that I don't know. We're all just people. At the end of the day, we all want to I don't know, have privacy preserving tech. We want to protect our freedoms. Yeah, that kind of thing. same um, team, same team. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I think Monero does. It does have that going for it because it's it's value prop is so distilled and simplified. It's like digital cash, mm -hmm. right? So like, like are you, you're in digital cash too? Yes or no? Because if we're both in the you know we should we shouldn't really you know we may have our disagreements on how, on how to get there, um, but it needs to be realized we're both working on that same thing. So how has what was your experience like working with Monero on it? Like we talked about it in more detail before on our version that we lost on, on what it was like on a technical level. Mm -hmm. uh, but how about, yeah, on a community level, like was it, what was the vibe, you know, working with Ethereum, uh, you know, uh, developing on Ethereum versus developing something for Monero? What was the vibe in dealing with the, the community and whatnot? Right, yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely differences, I would say. <laughs> like um, Ethereum, I would say, uh, I guess originally when I started, it was mostly just like developers developing on it. Like it was very like technical, like everyone was very into like technical side of things, um, that kind of thing. Um, but recently it's been a lot more like DeFi, like NFT pump type people. <laughs> so I would, I wouldn't, it's the vibe has changed a little, um, definitely. But I would say the, the core of the Ethereum um, community is mostly like 
yeah, technical kind of innovations and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, on the Monero side, um, yeah, it's definitely a different vibe, but I found it pretty welcoming, I would say. Um, definitely, like, when I first posted, like, a lot of people reached out to me and they're they all very nice and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, like, specific examples. Definitely Monero is more... Uh, more political <laughs> than the Ethereum in a lot of ways. Oh, okay. Um, like political, actually... like internal politics type thing or? Um, yeah, like, like not, maybe not like internal politics and more just like being politically minded, like being in it for like a political reason versus okay. for Ethereum, you might be in it more for like, I don't know, the kind of technical progress or whatever. Um, obviously there's people in both camps, um, but that's kind of the the overall vibe difference. I noticed. Okay, no, that's interesting. Yeah. So what do you see as being the political then vibe or like the political agenda of Monero? I'm not trying to get you in trouble. Just, <laughs> this is, I'm very curious. Yeah, well, obviously very like freedom and like liberty focused. Um, yes, okay. Yeah, like definitely before I kind of jumped into Monero, I sort of had like the vibe that it was like all like libertarians that were like super into like you know and like guns and like all that kind of stuff but yeah I found that it's a lot more varied than that um so yeah that was kind of a nice surprise and definitely yeah like at Monerotopia um it had a very like early crypto kind of vibe like it was like small like people were really like into it like for um yeah like just like what it does and that kind of thing um, yeah. our, our, our poor audio visual is really part of the, we, we did that on purpose, right? <laughs> that kind of that rustic, you know, oh, yeah. feel. <laughs> <Early laughs> that feel. Yeah. That was all done on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Apologize for our poor audio visual, by the way, at, at the uh, at Monerotopia. Oh yeah. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, your, your video came out great. We edited it. Uh, everybody could see, you know, what you were showing there. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. We should jump back to the atomic swaps because... Right. In the other video that got cut off, we talked about a little more detail. So if people wanted to start using it today, uh, what, what level of skill do they need? Can anybody start swapping between Monero and Ethereum? Right, yeah. So yeah, so first thing, yeah, it's only on stage now. I think you mentioned earlier it was on the net, but it's not currently. So just want to make that clear. But um, yeah, so to kind of get started on trying it out, you do need to be somewhat familiar with the terminal at this point. Um, like you need to, um, yeah, like be able to run a narrow node in um, a narrow wallet in the terminal, like the narrow wallet um, RPC. Um, and you need to, yeah, be able to kind of, yeah, download the source code and build it and that kind of thing. Um, there's instructions for all of this, but you do need to use the terminal for it. So you have to be somewhat comfortable there. Um, yeah. so. Yeah, I guess in future terms, um, my main kind of goal is having a, a UI that you can just use. Um, so, yeah, you'd be able to just go into this browser website and um, kind of do the swap from there. Um, you can use like your MetaMask wallet for the each side um, and then don't really have to interact with the terminal as much anymore. Um, yeah, I guess for for being a Monero um, maker, like for offering Monero, you Think I'd still, I think you'd still have to use the CLI kind of no matter what. Um, I'm not sure if there's any good like in browser wallets or like that kind of thing from Monero. So that's something I'd like to explore. But um, yeah, so you might be limited if you're um, a Monero maker. But yeah, on the each side, it should be pretty browser forward eventually. Now, can you you can currently be the maker from from both sides, the Ethereum or the Monero side? Um, no, so currently I have a site. You're only the maker for the Monero side. Um, so yeah, so the swap protocol has kind of a limitation there. Um, the, the Bitcoin one essentially has the same one. Like basically the the non Monero side has to move first um, and lock their funds first. Um, otherwise, there is a chance of basically um, if if you can be a maker, for example, as an Ethereum person, then a fake malicious party could come and just tell you, oh, I'm taking your offer, and then you lock your funds, and then it times out, and then you have to refund, and then so on and so forth until you use up all your funds with like gas fees and that kind of thing. 
um, versus if you're a Monero maker, um, since the side has to move first, you obviously like they'll move first and you won't be able to be, be grief like that. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I think the, the Bitcoin um, Monero swap people are working on potentially solutions for this, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a limitation, but yeah. And then could, could you try to explain what, what happens on a technical level in a swap? Like how, what, what keeps it essentially decentralized? How is it just chain to chain? What, what's, what's going on there? Right. Totally. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess for background info, like the idea with the atomic swap is that it's totally um, just peer to peer. There's only two parties involved. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so there's only two parties involved and they um, basically offline come together somehow and meet and decide to do this swap. Um, and the atomic part is that the, the swap either completes, um, so the assets get exchanged, or it refunds. Um, there's no, there's no potential like path where someone could lose their funds or someone ends up with like both the funds or that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so basically two parties meet, they decide to swap, and then um, what happens essentially is they um, offline generate like secrets essentially for um, the swap. So each party has a secret, and then um, on the each side they would lock the funds in a smart contract um and then the funds can be revealed or the funds sorry the funds can be um unlocked only if one of the the secrets is revealed um so if you're so say for example the the monero side wants to later claim it they would have to reveal their secret um and if the side wants to refund it they have to reveal their secret so then on the monero side the funds get locked in an account um that's specified um the private key is both the secrets added together so, so essentially what happens then is um if either party goes to the smart contract and um takes the eth out of it then they reveal their side of the secret essentially and then the other party can then combine it with their own and then take them in error on the other side. So, okay. so if the, if the Ethereum person acted and then took the Ethereum back, then basically it just allows the Monero, it auto auto sends the Monero back essentially. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah. Uh, you explained it very well though, actually better than, okay. you know, uh, most have explained atomic swap so far. So. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then, so how, how private is that? Where are the, uh, basically weak points with privacy? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, on the Monero side, kind of, once you have your Monero, like you're obviously protected by that. Um, it's, you have all the same kind of guarantees as normal Monero does. Um, but then on the ETH side, like there really isn't any privacy. So that's kind of unfortunate right now. Um, so yeah, so when you do the swap, like you can, like it's obvious that like an atomic swap is happening um, because people can see the contract on chain. They can see like how much ETH you're receiving or whatever. Um, and then potentially they could also use that to correlate like how much Monero is being received. Um, but they wouldn't be able to find the account that the Monero is being received in. So it's kind of still protected in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but then on, yeah, on the east side, it's still very open. Like it's not private, unfortunately. So um, theoretically, like if somebody was was KYC'd on the ETH side and they went and they said, you know, I want to get a thousand dollars worth of Monero for my, uh, you know, uh, for my Ethereum, uh, it would be potentially seen that that person sold, you know, whatever transferred a thousand of Ethereum for a thousand of Monero with their with their ID, but on mm -hmm. yeah, Monero side, you would you could stay anonymous. So yeah, what is the I guess so. The, the way of solving that would be so that it wouldn't be identifiable when a swap took place. Yeah. Yeah. So I have. Yeah, I have a few ideas on how to improve this. Um, so yeah, one of them is like, well, one of them like that's currently kind of trivial, I guess, is that you would use Tornado Cash before um, doing the swap, so that you could kind of like withdraw your ETH from there and then use like a fresh account. Um, but then it shows that like you use Tornado Cash or whatever, so. And that's like a yeah, whole other set of steps, so not super uh, clean, I guess. Um, so yeah, so some ideas I'm thinking of are having the ETH be deposited into like 
a, a pool. So potentially this could be like a train of cash shielded pool directly or like just some swap specific um, like shielded pool. So yeah, this would use like some ZK snarks similar to Torino Cash essentially on the ETH swap contract. So mm. yeah, so how this would work would be something like when you deposit into the swap contract, um, like you'd be able to see that you deposited, but um, you wouldn't be able to see like what happened from there. So you could potentially do like multiple swaps. You could potentially like, um, like not even do any swap, like that kind of thing. You could yeah, um, if it's like the train of cash shield pool, you could even like transfer the ETH to someone else and they can do the swap. Like there's, it's basically just hidden. So it adds a lot more um, plausible deniability essentially into what happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then also, I think I talked about, um, at Minerva Topia, I talked a lot about the, the network level kind of things. Um, so yeah, so currently it just uses like a the P2P connection, um, but essentially, Another kind of privacy hole is that the your IP is essentially revealed to like the other party that you're swapping with. Um, just yeah, by the nature of how networking kind of works at this point. Um, but there are yeah, I'm trying to work on ways essentially to have this not happen. So using some sort of like onion routing so that your um, IP isn't revealed or that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I guess one easy trivial way to kind of hide it right now is just using a VPN um, but then you have to kind of trust your VPN provider so yeah there's there's a few layers I guess to improve the privacy at um, so yeah. so from people on the ethereum side uh, it's like they could they could use this to get Monero but not anonymously essentially but people on the Monero side can use it to anonymously obtain ethereum yeah basically yeah. What, where do you see is more the demand being I mean from from going from Monero to Ethereum or Ethereum to Monero, where do you any predictions yeah. on on where the demand is going to be coming from more? That's a good question. Um, yeah, hopefully even, but um, yeah, I honestly have no idea. Like, I feel like there's there's parties that are interested in both. Um, like going from ETH to Monero, like people who maybe have ETH and want to I don't know have more privacy or use Monero for something or whatever, um, and not have to go through a centralized exchange. So I think there's people there, but then going the other way from Monero to Ethereum, maybe people have Monero, but they want to get some ease to do like some DeFi stuff or something like that. So they might want to use it the other direction. Um, yeah, I, yeah, we'll kind of see what happens, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. then so, so to to kind of solve that initial problem of a you know two sided marketplace, are are you know you got to get the the buyers and the sellers here of each currency, putting them you know getting them together. It's a peer to peer transaction. Do you think there needs to be some kind of pools on each side for that to to jumpstart it, so that there always is? You know, if I go to make a trade, I'll always find someone on the other side. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah good question. So, um, I guess since the way it's currently designed is that like only the Monero holders can be the makers, like there would definitely have to be like a Monero offer pool initially so that when ETH people come and try to swap, like they can easily find like a match. Um, but then like, obviously if you want Monero and want to go to ETH, you also don't want to wait around super long for someone to take it. Cause maybe like, I don't know, the prices fluctuate or like whatever, like something happens. Um, so yeah, ideally there would have to be like a good amount of users on both sides. Um, yeah, I've kind of, I thought a bit about ways to maybe pool the ETH somehow so that it can just like auto swap, but it definitely, it gets complicated fast. Um, <laughs> yeah. So potentially in the future, there could be something there too. Do you see it as being user friendly as a centralized exchange one day? Is that, do we get, do we get to that point or it's just going to be kind of, you know, niche and used for different purposes? Yeah. I mean, I hope it becomes as user friendly. <laughs> Yeah, I think if there's enough people using it, it would become essentially that user friendly. Um, but yeah, if there isn't a whole lot of liquidity, then it might not be as nice, um, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, like like I mentioned, there could be like price fluctuations. So you don't want your offer sitting there for like, I don't know, a week, because maybe the price difference changes a lot. Um, like you would ideally want it to be pretty fast. So yeah, currently centralized exchanges kind of have the upper hand there, but I think if people decide that I don't know, no more KYC, like peer to peer only, then atomic swaps kind of grow an adoption. Um, that's kind of the ideal case. Yeah. Yeah. You going to Monero Con in Portugal? Oh, 
I'm not currently planning to, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about it, but yeah, I've done a lot of traveling, so. Yeah, no, no. Same here, same here. We're we're going, though. Yeah, we're excited. Should be cool. Should be cool. That's awesome, yeah. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much. I apologize that we lost, you know, that first 20 (laughs) minutes there. Well, that that was just between me and you. It was was great. It was a great conversation. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we recovered pretty well. Is there anything is there anything else you want to bring up? Um, we'll see. Yeah, people, please try out the swap. <laughs> that would be the main thing. The more people try it out and give feedback, like the faster I can fix things, the faster we can like get it on mainnet and that kind of thing. So, please try when, it out. Um, when do you see it get, getting launched on mainnet? Any estimates? Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I guess I would. Yeah, obviously, like to finish the CCS, so like the UI and that kind of thing. Um, so ideally, can get that done uh, relatively soon, within like a, a month or two, um, and then hopefully in that time frame, people will ideally have tested it out more. Um, maybe once the UI with the stuff is ready, it will be easier as well for people to test it. So um, I want people to test it out like a good amount <laughs> before just plopping it on mainnet. Um, but definitely this year, I think is. Is feasible. Um, yeah, I think that'll happen. Exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. So obviously, you're looking for people to test it. Are you also looking for people to, to help you in ways with the development of it? Like you said, because you have to develop other components, like the UI. Is are those you're doing all those things on your own essentially? Um, I yeah, I have one team member helping with the UI currently, um, but all the yeah go side of things is all me. So yeah, definitely looking for yeah for contributors or. Yeah, any sort of sort of help there. People that can contribute to what aspects and explain because I yeah, just for for those of us that don't really understand development too well, like what what are the different uh, aspects you're looking for help with? Right, totally. Yeah, it could be like anything from smaller tasks like adding more like RPC endpoints or that kind of thing to like more complicated tasks like adding um, yeah like. Imp- yeah, improving the smart contract, like adding privacy features, um, like yeah, bigger stuff like that. Um, yeah, kind of all the way. And then also just like even reviewing the code, like making sure there's no like really bad stuff happening or that kind of thing. Um, I hope there isn't, but there could be. So <laughs> if people want to review it, like that would be really um, helpful as well. So yeah, a, a lot of different, yeah, ranging from small to large tasks, I would say there's a lot. Yeah. When you set out to do this, did you have like, did you just see it in your head right away? Like, all right, this is what I got to do. And it's just going to take this amount, you know, it's, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I, I, I know I could figure this out. Or was it like you went in not knowing if you would actually be able to make it work? Oh, I, I felt pretty confident that it would work. <laughs> yeah. Cause, um, yeah, I came up with the, the protocol initially. And then kind of once I had that, it's just a matter of sort of building the, like the network components and like the actual code around it. But um, I'd say coming up with the protocol is like the core of it, I would say. So once I had that, I felt pretty confident. What was like the most difficult aspect and like the thing that came with the biggest unknown where you're like, oh, like you were. The biggest unknown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it was like, it's like you're you're going, you're trying to hike Mount Everest here. Which part of it was like (laughs) the most difficult? Like you knew you could do it. Like there's there's definitely a, a path to do it. Uh, were there any parts where it was just, you know, very difficult to do? Um, hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> I feel like the... I'm not a developer, so I'm just... I mean, I have to imagine <laughs> there's like, you're making kind of breakthroughs along the way. Like, you know, you can do it, but uh, it's it obviously, you know, wasn't yet done. So you you had mm-hmm. to build all this stuff where there... What were the, the most difficult aspects? Yeah, I think so far, um, the initial part is definitely the hardest, like kind of, yeah, having come up with the protocol and like getting the development kind of started, I'd say once, once the product kind of grew, it became more smooth sailing, I guess, from there, like it was more simple to know what I kind of have to do next. Um, and I think, I think coming up, like the privacy improvements will definitely be challenging. Because um, I don't, yeah, I don't really know, like, yeah, how much that kind of thing has been done before. And yeah, it's sort of a, a new feel in some ways. So I think that will be challenging. Um, yeah. Advice to anybody out there that's like looking to develop on Monero? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say just, I don't know, go for it. Um, 
yeah, go for it on stage night. You probably need to mind your own stage night because none of the faucets work. Um, yeah, uh, use the Monero D, uh, like the <laughs> the development mode for it. Um, yeah, but really just like go for it. Like I found the community is very, I don't know, helpful and, and welcoming. Um, like when I first posted, a lot of people reached out and said like, oh, this is so cool. Like, um, yeah, everyone was very, really nice and like eager to help. So yeah, I'd say just kind of go for it. Awesome. All right, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so All much right. as well. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.